A thunder of jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle, and friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. Hurry, Bullwinkle, the show's about to start. I'm coming as fast as I can. Wait to the people. Yay! Now what are you doing? Sign an autograph. The see. John, Miss. But your name is Bullwinkle. I know, but that's hard to spell. We're gonna have a lot of fun. Come on and join us. Sure, there's always room for one more. That mighty monarch of the seas, the SS Andalusia, is plowing on her way to Pottsylvania, home of the mysterious mooseberry bush. Little does Bullwinkle know as he basks in the sunshine that right beside him is the very bush our heroes are seeking, disguised as Sir Thomas Lippenboros' Uncle Chomley. Nice day, ain't it? Must be beef. I say it's a nice day! He ain't beef, but he's pretty dumb. Meanwhile, Rocky has started for a turn around the deck with Sir Thomas and Lady Alice, who bear a striking resemblance to his old enemies, Boris and Natasha. Come on, Sir Thomas. The sea air is wonderful. I say, slow down a bit, old plum pudding. We must catch a spot of bread, eh, what? Okay. How's this? But the pace that Rocky said was still too fast for the spies, and as much as they wanted to get near him, he was always just a little too far ahead. Boris, I can't go on. What's the matter? My feet are killing me. I am used to high heels. The shoes are too comfortable. I can't stand them. Come on, Sir Thomas. Can't right now, old bean. Just remember, it's time for tea. Cheerio. Okay, I'll see you later. Gee, he's a nice guy for a duke. Back at the deck chair, Bullwinkle was still trying to start up a conversation with Uncle Chumley. So the other fellow says, that's funny, you don't look Chinese. <laughs> Ain't that a... Well, maybe not. Thinks he's so smart, won't even laugh at my jokes. Okay, don't talk. See if I care. You're just a sore head, and I'll tell you to your face, too. And Bullwinkle pulled away the handkerchief over Uncle Chumley's face. Uh-oh. That there is a mighty sick uncle. Look at that face. It's green. Covered with little red spots, too. I wonder if he's catching. <laughs> A short distance away, Sir Thomas was gleefully boring holes in the bottom of a lifeboat. Did I ever tell you, Natasha, I got a medal in drilling holes at USC. University of Southern California? No, Ukrainian safe-cracking college. Rocky! Rocky! What is it, Bullwinkle? It's Uncle Chumley. He's got a bad case of the red and green uglies and... Rocky, listen. Just at that moment, a loud bell began to ring close at hand. Lifeboat drill, lifeboat drill, take your stations, take your stations. What is it, Rock? It's lifeboat practice, Bullwinkle. Come on, this is our boat. Mooses and squirrels first, women and children next. Let's get in. Gee, it's getting foggy. Little did our friends know that the voice on the speaker was that of Sir Thomas Lippenboros, who waited just out of sight with a pair of cable snippers. Wait a minute. What about poor old Uncle Chumley? Get him, Bullwinkle. In an instant, the moose had grabbed the disguised mooseberry bush and dashed back into the lifeboat. Don't worry, Uncle Chumley. You're safe with us. Oh, he won't answer. Just sits there like a vegetable. All set in number five? All set. That's nice. And the wily spy cut the cables holding the lifeboat on its dagger. Moose overboard! And a moment later, Sir Thomas Lippenboros was waving farewell to the leaky lifeboat as it drifted away in the fog. Cheerio, Moose. Goodbye, Squirrel. Peep-peep, Uncle Chomley. Did you... Uncle Chomley? 
Boris, what have you done? Don, I've destroyed my own flesh and bush. Well, our heroes have the mooseberry bush, but what good is it a thousand miles from nowhere? Listen tomorrow for a drift in the mist or fog groggy. <laughs> Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. But that trick never works. This time for sure. Presto! Well, I'm getting close. And now it's time for another special feature. Once upon a time, there was a family of three sisters. The elder sister, Prunelda, was remarkably ugly. You might think that she was the ugliest woman you'd ever seen until you saw the second sister, Grimessa, who looked even worse. With two such hags in the family, it was surprising that the third sister, sweet little Beat, was very pretty, very pretty indeed. And how do you think that made her sisters feel? Terrible! And what do you think they did? We treat her something awful, of course. As a matter of fact, Sweet Little Beat was so used to her treatment that she took no notice of it. Prunelda, you'll just ruin that poker. Fun's fun, Grimessa, but this isn't getting the floor mopped. When the two sisters tired of thumping on Little Beat, they played ball with her. Okay, put her over! Please, girls, I have to get the silver. Then, one day, as Grimessa was preparing another unpleasant surprise for Little Beat, Prunelda burst in with exciting news. His Highness, Prince Fascinato, was searching for a bride to share his kingdom and his castle, where he now lived alone, attended only by his Prime Minister. The Prime Minister's job was to serve the Prince in every way. This was difficult because the Prince Fascinato was invisible. No one could see him. If he picked up a bowl, you could see the bowl move. If he ate, you could see the food disappear, but you could not see where to. One day, the prince had said to his prime minister, You know, Winnie, I should be married. Yes, your majesty. I'm not on the throne, Winnie. I'm over here. Oh, oh, oh yes, your majesty. There must be a girl somewhere who can see me. You line up all the eligible ladies, and we'll see if any of them can make the grade. So the Prime Minister had sent out word of the contest, and soon all the girls in the kingdom were in front of the castle, waiting to see the invisible prince. Vendors were doing a brisk business in tip sheets and clues to what he looked like. Crystal balls were at a premium, and right at the head of the line were Prunelda and Grinissa. First girl. I see you. I see you. His Highness isn't here yet. Oh. <clears throat> the rules are as follows. You must first tell what the prince is wearing on his shoulder. Yeah, yeah. Second, you must tell what his bowstring is made of. Bowstring like a bow and arrow? Correct. And remember, in case of a tie, duplicate princes will not be awarded. If, uh, if I guess those two things will marry even me? Even, ugh. You. <laughs> I could use that kind of a break. And the Prime Minister pulled aside a curtain at one end of the room. I see you, sweetheart. Let's get hitched. Uh, one moment. What does His Highness wear on his shoulder? Uh, a gold oak leaf cluster and a tattoo that says, remember the main. Wrong. Now, what is his bowstring made of? Cat gut. Next. The next contestant was Grimessa. You. Honey, I see you. Not me, madam. Him. What is on the prince's shoulder? Uh, two kumquats and a bald eagle with a flag in his mouth. Next. All day long, the girls of the kingdom tried to see the prince. Nobody succeeded. When the two ugly sisters returned home, they were very sad, of course. But when sweet little Beat announced that she was going to try... <laughs> What's so funny? Prince marry a beat-up little peanut like you! You're crazy. Not crazy enough to stay in this house anymore. You mean you're mad because we treat you so mean? No, I just can't stand all that ugly anymore. Ugly? You know she's right. So, sweet little Beat went to the palace and straight up to the throne. Hey, you, where's the invisible prince? You, 
You can see him? Sure, I see him, but where's Prince Fascinato? Oh, what's he wearing on his shoulder? A rainbow. Is that it? It's close enough. And what is his bowstring made of? Is that his bowstring? Looks more like the Milky Way. Your Majesty? It's true. Oh, fair maiden, you're the one for me. You're the prince? Yes. Let us be wed. You will be my princess, live in my castle. Yes. Sweet little Beat was the only girl who could see Prince Fascinato. Her sisters who had followed her were amazed. You... you see him? Well, sure. Now, come on, let's go home. But aren't you going to stay here and marry the prince? Stay here? You forget. I've seen him. Believe me, he's uglier than you are. Uh, you know she's right. So the three sisters went home together and lived happily ever after, which, of course, points to a moral. Yes. Be it ever so painful, there's no place like home. That's a pretty strange-looking painting, Bullwinkle. I just paint what I see. Well, what do you see? This is what I see. Hello, poetry lovers. Today's poem is a story of crime in the big city. Tom, Tom, the Piper's son. Boom, boom, boom. Tom, Tom, the Piper's son, stole a pig and away he... Oop. Police officer, what do you got in the bag? It's a sort of a pig. You got a permit to pack a pig? Well, no, I... Better come along with us. You know it's a felony to pack a pig over a state line? No. Pig napping. But it's a pig in a poem. What a pig in a poke, huh? What poke, poem, pig in a poem. Pig poem. But it's so pig, it's about... You making fun of the way we talk? Well, no, but it's catching. Name? I'm Tom, Tom, the Piper's son. All right, Piper's son, what were you going to do with the pig? Well, the poem says the pig was eat, but... Gonna eat it, huh? No. On a platter, huh? No. Apple in its mouth like that. Certainly not. All right, Piperson, you can go, but don't leave town. Thanks. Can I have my pig back? No. Evidence. Darn. One more thing, Piperson. What's that? You got an apple on you. And now it's time for... Four, five, or six baritone solos in the key of E. But... Meet my... Ooh. Now for another of our special features. Should have tried E flat. At the close of the 19th century, Canada was overrun with Canadians and smugglers. The best Canadian, but the worst smuggler was Snidely Whiplash. Whiplash and his band of smugglers were traveling through Canada as a band of musicians. Unfortunately, his music was very bad. Of course it's bad. Not only are my boys tone deaf, but their instruments are filled with stolen furs. Yes, that was how the arch criminal smuggled furs out of Canada. But like all lawbreakers, he had yet to reckon with the mounted police. You are looking at the pride of that noble force, our hero, Dudley Do-Right. <laughs> and this is Dudley Do-Right's horse. <laughs> the apple of Dudley's eye was the beautiful yet unpredictable Nell Fenwick. <laughs> Dudley loved Nell. Unfortunately, she loved his horse. But, Nell, why won't you marry me? Because you are too good, Dudley. For you, Nell, I would rotten up. The Mounty Post was under the command of Inspector Fenwick, Nell's father. Send Constable Do-Right in here and tell him to hurry. <laughs> You sent for me, sir? Yes, I did do right. Snidely Whiplash is attempting to smuggle furs over the border into the United States. I shall need an undercover man to join him and expose his evil plan. Let's send Nell, sir. My daughter, no do right. We have to send a mountain. Then you go, sir. I have to watch the store. You're the man, do right. But, Inspector, my, my reputation, Whiplash would never let me join him. Yes, your record is spotless. We shall have to dirty it, sir. 
somewhat. Here's my plan. You shall commit a disgraceful act, get thrown out of the service, and become a bad guy. Thus it was that one hour later, Constable Dudley Do-Right, the man who could do no wrong, set fire to the Alberta Hotel. Do-Right, are you responsible for this holocaust? Why, yes, I am. Well, congratulations, my boy. This hotel was condemned last year, and we've been wondering how to tear it down. You'll be decorated for this. Do-Right, you idiot. Don't do right, do wrong. Somebody blew up the dams! Would you mind holding this plunger until the police get here and arrest me? Constable Do-Right has already admitted that it was he who dynamited the dam. Yes, in one brilliant stroke, the problem of irrigating our valley has been solved. Do-Right, have you ever been assassinated? But, Inspector, I have been trying. Well, then don't try. And that did the trick. At mess that evening, Dudley ate his peas with a knife, something no Mountie would ever do, and consequently was drummed out of the service with a dishonorable discharge. Do right. You're a disgrace to your underwear. Good work, my boy. Now join up with Snidely Whiplash. Farewell, Nell. Perhaps we'll meet again. But, Dudley, why must your horse go with you? After all, you ate the peas. Yes, but with his knife. Adios, Nell. One week later, in a border town ballroom... So you're a musician, eh? Yes. Can you read music? No. You're hired. Dudley brought out an alpine horn and proceeded to captivate the audience. But during the 33rd chorus of Wabash Cannonball, the tuba player started spraying furs all over the bandstand. Whiplash, the jig is up. You are under arrest. Drop that tuba. And the tuba player did on Dudley. In exactly five minutes, do right. My men, the Furs and I, will be safely across the border. You too will be crossing the border at a much higher altitude. Four minutes and 59 seconds later, Snidely Whiplash and his men were about to set foot across the border when... Halt! You are under arrest! Hey, Dad, do right! How did you escape? I didn't, Whiplash. There are two of us. The one you left tied up back there in the shack was my horse in a Dudley suit. And here he comes now! Good work, horse. Good work, Do-Right. You not only saved the furs and captured the smugglers, but you got their ringleader, Snidely Whiplash. Oh, no, you didn't. Snidely, how did you escape? There are two of us! <laughs> Have you got your horse's knife on you, Do-Right? Yes, sir. Then go eat peas. You've got to do it all over again. Let's send Nell, sir. We can't. She's not a mountain. Then you go. Ready, Rock? You sure you know how to work that thing? No. Anyways, here's what it was supposed to look like. Well, our heroes are all at sea, for Boris Badenov has tricked them into a leaky lifeboat, cut the cables, and watched them drift away in the fog. Little does he know that the boys have taken the priceless mooseberry bush with them, disguised as an old gentleman named Uncle Chumley. Hey, Bullwinkle, this boat is leaking. You know I got the same sneaky feeling? We gotta find something to plug up the hole. I got this one stopped. Yeah, but what about that one? You might lend a hand, Uncle Chumley, instead of just sitting there. Bullwinkle, I got an idea. What is it? Stand on your head. Is that your idea of an idea? Quick, we can use your antlers as plugs. Sure enough, as fate would have it, when Bullwinkle stood on his head, the points of his antlers just fit the holes in the bottom of the boat. It's working, Bullwinkle. You stopped the leak. Show us what you can do if you just use your head. Now all we have to do is wait for the SS Andalusia to find us. I hope they hustle it up. My brains are getting soggy. Don't worry, they'll pick us up in a couple of minutes. Rocky wouldn't have been so confident if he knew more about the Andalusia, for she was under the command of Captain Peter Peachfuzz, the world's worst sailor. Even as a youth, Peter Peachfuzz had wanted to be a captain, but something always went wrong. 
At 18, Peter joined the Navy, where due to his sailing through the Panama Canal in the wrong direction, he wound up in command of the only icebreaker in the South Seas. Half ahead, port! Stand by to jettison the supercargo! Titicanoo and Tyler, too! On the double! His seamanship won him scores of medals, all donated by the enemy. And a nickname was bestowed on him by his grateful shipmates, Wrong Way Peach Fuzz. After his military service, he assumed command of a smaller vessel plying the coastal waters. Then one day, a maiden aunt died and left him a hundred million dollars. Of course, Peter's first act was to buy the SS Andalusia and hire himself as captain. His second act was to run right into the Brooklyn Bridge. Hard as stern! Block that kick! Next day, after he tried to sail the Andalusia up 42nd Street to Times Square, his officers held a special meeting. He's a mutton-headed idiot! Couldn't command a boat in a bathtub. He's a bird brain! As a bird lover, I'll assent that. Yes, gentlemen, he is an incompetent nincompoop. He really has only one qualification. What's, What's that? that? He's the captain. But we got to do something. I think I have a plan. And so late that night, the officers watched as the ship's carpenter quietly disconnected the captain's steering wheel and telegraph. Of course, Peach Fuzz never noticed the change. Well off! Hold that line! But the ship was actually run from another set of controls on a lower deck. Unfortunately, while all the other officers were searching for our heroes, Captain Peach Fuzz made a wrong turn and wound up in the right room. The result was instant panic. The Andalusia spun around in circles and then started off at full speed in all directions at once. You hear that, Bullwinkle? Won't be long now. Hey, here we are! Hokey smoke, Bullwinkle, get off! The steamer's heading right for us! Look out! And the tremendous bulk of the SS Andalusia swept past without even slowing down. Boy, that was too close for comfort. Yeah, if I ever catch the nitwit who's steering that boat, I... Nothing personal, you understand? Look out, Bullwinkle! Here she comes again! This time she's really gonna run us down! And sure enough, the knife-like prow of the huge ocean liner struck the lifeboat squarely in the middle. Don't miss our next episode, The Deep Six, or The Old Moose and the Sea. Just enough left to tell him who the sponsor was. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop.